In this video, we'll talk about angles and their relationship to circles. We'll start with a ray. A ray consists of one point on a line and all points extending in one direction from that line. The point from which the ray extends, which in this picture is the point E, is called the end point or the base point of the ray. From E, it extends in one direction. It's an arrow, but it goes on infinitely, indefinitely. A ray with endpoint E that passes through some other point F is denoted EF with an arrow on top. F can be any point on the ray, any point other than E. It's just a way of giving a name to the ray so we can refer to it later. This allows us to define an angle. An angle is the union of two rays having a common endpoint. In this case, we call the common endpoint the vertex of the angle, and the two rays are called the sides of the angle. So in this picture, we see two rays, EF and ED. They have a common endpoint. This is the vertex. EF and ED are the two sides of the angle. An angle with vertex E and sides ED and EF, like in this picture, is denoted angle DEF. This symbol means angle, angle DEF. DEF, you have one point on one side, the vertex, and then a point on the other side. Angle DEF would be the same as angle FED. It's just a way of referring to the angle. An angle in the xy plane is said to be in standard position if its vertex is located at the origin, and one of its sides is drawn along the positive x-axis. The side along the x-axis is called the initial side, and the other side is called the terminal side. So it's the initial side singular, not plural, and the other side is called the terminal side. When constructing an angle, we think of it dynamically. We start with the initial side, and then we rotate a certain amount to get to the terminal side. So we start with the initial side, and then we rotate to get to the terminal side. Rotations in the counterclockwise direction are considered positive rotations. We could also rotate in the negative direction, that is, clockwise. We can even get the same terminal side if we go far enough. So moving counterclockwise is a positive rotation. And moving clockwise is a negative rotation. A common way to measure the size of an angle is using degrees. A full rotation is 360 degrees. Other important angles are 0 degrees, when you don't rotate at all, 90 degrees, which is a quarter rotation. Notice that 90 degrees is a positive number, so we're rotating in the counterclockwise direction. 180 degrees is a turn all the way around. Not all the way around and facing the same way again, but you're facing one direction and then you're turning around so you're facing the other direction. This is a half rotation. It's 180 degrees. Again, we're measuring 180 degrees in the counterclockwise direction because it's positive. 370 degrees is a three-quarter rotation. It's positive, so once again, it's in the counterclockwise direction. We could also measure this angle using a clockwise rotation, and that would be negative 90 degrees. So 270 degrees represents three-quarter rotation counterclockwise, and negative 90 degrees represents a quarter rotation clockwise. 
but either way you end up facing the same direction. Notice these numbers 1, 2, 3, 4. These numbers number the quadrants. This is the first quadrant, the second quadrant, the third quadrant, and the fourth quadrant. Notice that the numbers are increasing as we move counterclockwise. In mathematics, usually counterclockwise means an increasing direction or a positive rotation. Another common way to measure the size of an angle is what we call radian measure. We use radian measure to measure what are called central angles of a circle. A central angle of a circle is one that has its vertex at the origin of the circle, or at the center of the circle. An angle theta measures one radian, in which case we'd write theta equals one, if the arc it intercepts has length equal to the radius of the circle. When we say the arc that it intercepts, we mean the arc between the two points where the rays intersect the circle. So in this case, we have an angle, which is measured by theta. And it intersects the arc, or it intersects the circle, creating an arc. And we call that the intercepted arc. So an angle theta that measures one radian, so in this picture, theta equals one, if the arc it intercepts has length equal to the radius of the circle. So the radius of the circle is r, and the arc that it intercepts has length r. So it has length one radius. So that's what radian measure means. It's measuring the length of an arc in terms of the radius. So if the intercepted arc is one radius, then theta measures one radian. It gives you one radius. Since the circumference of a circle having radius r is 2 pi r, there are 2 pi radians in one complete circle. So one complete revolution is 2 pi radians. Since 2 pi is approximately equal to 6.28, there are just over 6 radians in a complete revolution. So here is our angle theta, which measures 1 radian. So we write theta equals 1. So that means the arc that it intercepts has length r. If we measure out lengths r along the circle, so that length is r, this length is r, this length is r, this length is r, and this length, oops, excuse me, this length is r then you can see that we have six r's and just a little bit more. One, two, three, four, five, six, and just a little bit more. So the length or the size of this angle, which gives you one complete revolution, is just over six radians, because the arc that is the entire circle measures 2 pi radians. So one complete revolution is 2 pi radians, because you can count out six, the length of six radiuses, or radii, radii is the plural of radius, and just a little bit extra. So that little bit extra is the difference between 2 pi and 6. So this length right here equals 2 pi minus 6 radiuses. It's possible to convert between degrees and radians because we know that one revolution around a circle is 360 degrees, but it's also 2 pi radians. So that means 360 degrees converts to 2 pi radians. This equation allows us to convert between radians and degrees. One degree is equal to pi over 180 radians, and one radian is equal to 180 over pi degrees. We obtain these by simply dividing. 
So 1 degree is 2 pi over 360 radians. 2 pi over 360. But of course, that reduces to pi over 180. Similarly, if we want to solve for radians, we just divide by 2 pi. And then we'll have that 1 radian is 360 degrees over 2 pi. And that reduces to 180 over pi. So I should put little degree symbols next to 180 and 360. I don't need to put any symbol next to the radians. In fact, radians are a unitless quantity. They're just a number. They don't have units associated with them. They're called radians, but we don't actually write down the units. Let's look at this example. Convert pi over 3 radians to degrees. So we just have to use the fact that uh, 360 degrees is equal to 2 pi radians. I'll write radians in at this point, even though, as I mentioned, you don't need to. Radians are a unitless quantity. We, we just treat them as a number. So, of course, this if we divide everything by 2, this is 180 degrees equals pi radians. So this is what we use to do our conversion. So here we have pi over 3 radians, which I'll just abbreviate as rad, and we want to convert this to degrees. So that means we multiply by 180 degrees over pi radians. So that tells us the radians cancel out, and we just have degrees. That pi cancels with that pi, and we have 180 degrees divided by 3, which is 60 degrees. So pi over 3 radians is equal to 60 degrees. It's helpful when you're converting to actually write out the radians because then you can make sure that you have the units in the right spot, keeping in mind that the degrees have a unit, but the radians, we're just calling them by name rather than actually giving them a unit. Radians are just numbers. Convert 140 degrees to radians. So 140 degrees times pi radians is 180 degrees. So the degrees cancel. And we're left with 140 pi over 180. So we can reduce this. The zeros cancel, so to speak. 14 pi over 18. And both of these are divisible by 2. So this is 7 pi over 9. I've already mentioned this. It's standard to not write the word radians when doing computations with angle measure. So pi is a half rotation counterclockwise. 2 pi is a full rotation counterclockwise. 3 pi is one full rotation together with a half rotation. 4 pi is two full rotations counterclockwise. Negative pi is a half rotation clockwise. Negative 2 pi is a full rotation clockwise. Uh, these are just examples. So as I mentioned, radian measure is a unitless quantity because it is the measure of the length of an arc relative to the length of the radius. You're counting out how many radii your arc length measures. So it's a count rather than a unit. So to put that in terms of some symbols here, Radian measure is a measure of the length of an arc relative to the length of the radius, which we already said. So if a circle has a radius of length r and a central angle that measures theta radians, then the intercepted arc has length theta r. So here I wrote theta r and here r theta, but those are the same quantities. So you're really counting out how many radiuses or radii. Radii is the plural of radius. So if you have theta as your central angle, then the measure of this intercepted arc will be theta times r, theta radii. So we can say that, state that as a theorem. This is the arc length formula. So if s is the length of an arc on a circle, so if this is s, if this length is s, then s is equal to r times theta, where r is the length of the radius and theta is the measure in radians of the corresponding central angle. 
So this makes it very easy to compute the length of an arc if you're given it in radians, because you just take that angle and you multiply it by r. Now there's one angle that we all know about already, which is the full circle. So the full rotation. That's when theta is equal to 2 pi. So in that case, the arc length is theta times r, which is 2 pi r. And this is the circumference of the circle. So you can see that this formula is just a generalization of the formula for the circumference of the circle. So if s is the length of this arc, then the radian measure of the central angle is s over r because we know that s is equal to theta times r. So if we just solve this for theta, theta is equal to s over r. So s is a unit, is measured in units of length, and so is r. So this is a ratio of two lengths. So the units will cancel. So that's what we mean when we say that radian measure is a unitless quantity. It's just a number. We call them radians because we need to know what they are but it's just a number without any unit. It is important to remember the radian measure of certain special angles, especially these angles in the first quadrant. These are known as the reference angles. So 30 degrees is pi over 6. 45 degrees is pi over 4. 60 degrees is pi over 3. These are important angles to remember. Additionally, all of the angles where the terminal side is either along the x-axis or the y-axis, those need to be remembered. Zero degrees is zero radians. We also have a 2 pi here because this is also 360 degrees. 90 degrees is pi over 2. 180 degrees is pi. 270 degrees is 3 pi over 4. These are all positive measures. We're measuring them with a counterclockwise rotation. So we start at the, along the positive x-axis and we move counterclockwise along the circle. These angles in the first quadrant are called reference angles because they allow you to compute these other important angles by thinking the, of them geometrically. So notice that everything in quadrant two is a reflection of everything in quadrant one through the y-axis. In quadrant four, it's the reflection through the x-axis. In quadrant three, it's the reflection through the y and then the x, or the x then the y, however you prefer it. Either way you think about it, these are the important angles that you should remember. Let's talk about coterminal angles. If two angles have the same initial and terminal sides, they're said to be coterminal. So in, ex in this example, you have an angle measuring theta here. Now, if we go theta and then keep going around for a full rotation, that measures theta plus two pi. So we turn theta and then we stop there. Or we turn theta and then we keep going and do another complete full rotation. No matter how you do it, you end up facing the same direction. These two angles are what we call coterminal. They have the same initial side and the same terminal side. Generally speaking, anytime you have an angle theta, if you add onto that a complete rotation, you'll end up with a coterminal angle. In fact, adding or subtracting a full rotation will result in a coterminal angle no matter how many times you do it. So if I start here, along the positive x-axis, and then I rotate theta units, or theta radians in this case, then I'll be facing this direction. If I add a complete rotation, I'm still facing the same direction. And then I could do it again, and again, and again. Every time I do a complete rotation, I add 2 pi, or 180 degrees. No matter how many times I do a complete rotation, I'll end up facing the same direction. 
so I keep getting a coterminal angle every time I add 2 pi. Similarly, I could subtract 2 pi and go all the way around rotating clockwise. And if I did a full rotation, I'd still end up facing the same direction. So anytime you add 2 pi or subtract 2 pi, you end up with a coterminal angle. If you're measuring in degrees, you could add or subtract 360 degrees, and that will give you a coterminal angle. Theorem. Any angle has a coterminal angle with measure in the interval from 0 to 360 degrees. In terms of radian measure, the interval is 0 to 2 pi. Now, notice that we're not including the right endpoint. That's because 360 degree angle is coterminal to a 0 degree angle. And a 2 pi angle is coterminal to one that measures 0 degrees. If we just go back to our chart here of important angles, 0 degrees, a 0 degree angle, is the same, at least in the sense of coterminal angles, as you're starting and facing the positive x axis, you do one complete rotation, you're still facing along the positive x axis. So a 0 degree angle is coterminal with a 360 degree angle. And similarly, in terms of radian measure, a zero, an angle that measures 0 radians is coterminal to one that measures 2 pi radians. It's for that reason that in this theorem we exclude the right endpoint. So your method for finding the angle in these intervals, you have a given angle, if it's more than 360 degrees, subtract 360 until you get a number in the correct range. If the angle is negative, then add 360 until you get a number in that range. So if you start with something which is positive but bigger than 360, subtract 360. And keep subtracting 360 until you're in this range. If, you're no, if your angle is negative, then add 360. And keep adding 360 until you get a positive angle. And it will be in this range. In terms of radians, you add or subtract 2 pi until you get an angle in the interval from 0 to 2 pi. Let's do an example. So we're going to be given an angle measure, and then we want to find the measure of an angle, which is coterminal, but within the range from 0 to 360 degrees, or from 0 to 2 pi if we're doing it in radians. Let's write that down, or 0 less than or equal to theta less than or equal to 2 pi if using radians. So our first example is 750 degrees. We want to find a coterminal angle that has measure theta in between 0 and 360 degrees. So this number, in this case, 400, excuse me, 750, this number is bigger than 360. So in order to find the coterminal degree, we just subtract 360. Subtract a full rotation. So 750 degrees minus 360 degrees. So if we do this, we take 1 from the 7, add it to the 5, that gives us 90 and 3. So 750 degrees is coterminal to an angle which is 390 degrees, but that's still too big. So we take 390 degrees and from that we subtract 360 again. And that gives us 0, 3, 0. So that's a 30 degree angle. So what that tells us is that in this case, theta is equal to 30 degrees is coterminal. to a 750 degree angle. So 750 degree angle is coterminal to one that's 30 degrees. Okay, let's switch to radians. Now, in terms of radians, we want to be between 0 and 2 pi. Here we have 25 pi over 6. That's bigger than 2 pi. So what we're going to do is we're going to subtract 2 pi from it. So 25 pi over 6 minus 2 pi. Let's give them a common denominator, 6 over 6. 
So that's 25 pi over 6 minus 12 pi over 6, which is 13 pi over 6. Now, this is still out of the range, because this is still bigger than 2 pi. 2 pi is the same as 12 pi over 6. So 2 pi is 12 pi over 6. 13 pi over 6 is bigger than 12 pi over 6, by just a little bit, just by 1 sixth. So that means we need to subtract 2 pi again. So 13 pi over 6. So a 25 pi over 6 angle is coterminal to one that's 13 pi over 6, but that's still too big. So we're just going to subtract 2 pi from it. So again, we give them a common denominator. So it's going to be 13 pi over 6 minus 12 pi over 6, which of course is just pi over 6. So a 25 pi over 6 angle is coterminal to one that's pi over 6. Okay, what about this one? Negative pi over 8 pi over 3. Now, this is outside of the range because there's a negative sign there. So if you have a negative angle, just add 2 pi. So it will be negative 8 pi over 3, and then we just add 2 pi to that. So now, again, we need to give them a common denominator. So that means we want to multiply by 3 over 3. So minus 8 pi over 3 plus 6 pi over 3. And that is equal to negative 2 pi over 3. But negative 2 pi over 3 is still a negative angle, so that's still too small. So what we do is we just keep on, you just keep on adding 2 pi until you get a positive angle. So give them a common denominator again. Of course, that's just going to be 6 pi over 3. So it's minus 2 pi over 3 plus 6 pi over 3 which in this case is going to give us 4 pi over 3. And this is indeed less than 2 pi. It's a positive angle, which is less than 2 pi. In terms of thirds, so 2 pi is equal to 6 pi over 3. So let me just write this in green again. So this is 6 pi over 3. So in other words, 4 pi over 3 is indeed less than 6 pi over 3. So that's how we know that it's in the right range. So negative 8 pi over 3 is coterminal with 4 pi over 3. On the next slide, we have a picture of this. So what we're seeing here is the angle in question. 4 pi over 3 is this measure right here. You're measuring things in thirds. So 1 pi over 3, 2 pi over 3, 3 pi over 3 would be 180 degrees, or just pi. So this is 4 pi over 3. So this one is 4 pi over 3 radians. So that's going in the counterclockwise direction. If you go in the clockwise direction, like this, what you're seeing here is negative 2 pi over 3. That's this one right, right here, negative 2 pi over 3. So we start here along the positive x-axis. Negative 1 pi over 3 is here. Negative 2 pi over 3 is here. So that's negative 2 pi over 3, is this little arc right here. Now to get to negative 8 pi over 3, we just make a full rotation. So we go from negative 2 pi over 3, and then another full rotation all the way around, and that will give us the negative 8 pi over 3. But this, 4 pi over 3, that gives us our coterminal angle. So you notice it has the same initial side and the same terminal side. But in some sense, these seem different, right? Because negative 2 pi over 3 is what we call an acute angle. And 4 pi over 3 is an obtuse angle. It's greater than 180 degrees. To be coterminal, 
we're just talking about the same initial side and terminal side. So it has nothing to do with which side of the angles you're on, whether you're on the narrow side or the wide side. Radian measure makes it really easy to describe the length of an arc along a circle, because really that's how radian measure is defined. But it also makes it very easy to find areas of what we call sectors. So a sector of a circle is the region bounded by two radii, which is the plural of radius, and the intercepted arc. So it makes one of these pie shapes. So if you imagine that this circle is a pizza, then this is a, a slice of pizza. So it's a little, it's a, a pie shape or a wedge shape. So this gives you what we call a sector. It's bounded by two radii and the intercepted arc. So there's a very nice theorem that tells us how to find the area of a circular sector. So the area of a sector of a circle, where the circle has radius r, and the central angle is theta, is equal to one-half theta times r squared. This is actually a more general version of a formula we already know, which is the area of a circle. So remember that the area of a circle is pi r squared. But in that case, what is the central angle for a circle? For the whole circle, theta is equal to 2 pi. That's a full rotation. So if you use this formula, you'll have that area is equal to 1 half times theta, which is 2 pi, times r squared. The twos cancel, and you end up with a is equal to pi r squared. So indeed, this is the same formula that gives you the, the area of the circle. But now we're looking at it in sort of a fractional way. We're looking at pieces of the circle, not the whole thing, but just these sectors. Let's do an example. A sprinkler sprays a distance of 10 feet while rotating pi over 3 radians. What is the area of the region that the sprinkler waters? Well, in this case, we're looking at a fraction of a circle. So if we draw the whole circle, or we attempt to draw a circle, there we go. So we're imagining that the circle is, or the sprinkler is placed at the center of this circle. So right about there. And it rotates only pi over 3 units. So it's going to look something like this. So this is our theta. It's pi over 3. Now the radius is the distance that it sprays, which is 10 feet. So that tells us that the area is 1 half times theta r squared, and now we just plug in the values. 1 half pi over 3 times r, but r is 10 squared. So that's 100 pi over 2 times 3. I'm not going to multiply that out because I'm actually going to take that 2 and divide it out of that 100, and that'll give me 50. So I'll have 50 pi over 3. So that's the area of the lawn that gets sprayed by the sprinkler.